In this lecture, we're going to start to look at unsupervised learning. Uh, I'm going also to include in this lecture some things that, uh, strictly speaking, are not unsupervised learning, but they are related because often we use unsupervised learning techniques to solve those problems. So this is uh, visualization. There are uh, many unsupervised learning techniques to help understand data and visualize data. Uh, and also feature selection, which although strictly speaking not uh, usually done in uh, with unsupervised learning techniques it's also related to what we're going to see next lecture with feature extraction and that uh, is often done with unsupervised learning so basically we are shifting from uh, the kind of approach that we saw previously with supervised learning where we have some target for uh, regression or classification, something that we're trying to predict. And now we're going to uh, try to extract useful information from the data, not necessarily trying to predict something here. So the idea of unsupervised learning is that we are not using uh, labels or target values in training. Uh, so we don't have this error measure that we can use to supervise the performance of the learner. And our goal is to find structure in data. So we can imagine that we have some feature values on our data and what our learner will do is create new feature values that are useful to understand the data. For example, cluster labels, if we want to group the, the data in some ways, uh, a different representation of the data, a different way of transforming it in order to improve uh, the the ease with which we can solve some problem and so on. So uh, the idea here is not that we can only use uh, data without labels. We can use labeled data. We can use any data for unsupervised learning, but that we are not trying to predict uh, these values. So it's not uh, adjusting some model to try to predict something. And uh, so it's possible to use unsupervised learning to help with the classification problems, for example, trying to learn a better transformation of the data to make the make it easier to classify. But we can also do um, unsupervised learning for other purposes, for example, for understanding data, for visualizing it better, for estimating distributions, clustering, grouping things together, and so on. So in this lecture, we're going to start looking at uh, visualization and feature selections. We are not yet going to start uh, seeing unsupervised learning techniques, but these are areas that are related to unsupervised learning because often we use unsupervised learning techniques for uh, these kinds of problems. So in the next lectures, we're going to start uh, looking at these uh, kinds of methods. So let's start with the problem of visualizing data. So far, uh, I've been cheating a bit because I've been showing you mostly data sets that are in two dimensions. And in two dimensions, it's very easy to visualize the data. But this classical data set that we saw previously, the, the IRIS data set, has uh, four features for uh, describing the, the different flowers. So basically, the data is in four dimensions. We've been looking at projections of this data in two dimensions. But if we wanted to understand how the data is in four dimensions, we have a problem in that we cannot visualize things in four dimensions. So we need some way of uh, extracting that information from the data in order to help us uh, understand it. So for these examples, I'm going to use the, the Pandas uh, library. Uh, this is installed with uh, uh, your installation of Anaconda if you installed the, the recommended uh, distribution of Python. Uh, and uh, this is a very useful library for handling uh, data in tables. Uh, you have lots of, of uh, functionalities for, for crossing different tables, for selecting data and so on. We are not going to, to focus on this on this course and, and it's not required uh, that you know how to use the Pandas library for this course, but it's very useful for that kind of thing and it helps a lot with visualization because it implements uh, several of these visualization methods that help us understand data in, in higher dimensions. So when we have more than two features. If you want, you can take a look at the documentation. There are several examples there uh, of visualization. For the, this course and for this lecture, we're only going to use uh, Pandas to load the data and then do some uh, of the plots. 
So uh, in these examples, we're going to load uh, the, the data. We're going to use this uh, CSV file that has the, the name of the class here in the last column and then has the, the sepal length, sepal width, and petal length and petal width in the first four columns. Um, Pandas is very useful for this kind of, of data because it automatically names the different columns and uh, uh, it uh, checks the, the type of uh, uh, data that we have, whether numbers or text uh, in each field and so on. So uh, it's very easy to load this data into a data frame object and then manipulate it uh, uh, as we want. So basically what we're going to do is to import the read CSV function from Pandas and this function will read uh, a CSV file and uh, uh, output a data frame object with the, the, the table that it read. And this data frame object has methods for visualizing the data. For example, you can use the plot method with the uh, uh, histogram and uh, you can uh, draw, in this case, overlapping the histograms of the different four features. Note here uh, an important trick. We need uh, uh, transparency in the, in the bars, otherwise we cannot see them when they overlap. So this is the, the alpha um, argument here, which is the opacity of uh, each uh, uh, representation, each bar that is going to be drawn on the plot. Alpha equals 1 will be completely opaque, we'll have no transparency. If we put a, an alpha value of 1 half, this is uh, 1 half transparent, so we can see here when the different uh, uh, sets of values overlap. So this is one way of examining in the individual features and comparing them uh, with one another. So we can see that the, the sepal width, for example, is around here around three and the sepal length is here uh, longer uh, around six uh, uh, and so forth this i think these are millimeters or centimeters i'm not sure and um, so you we have uh, the we can immediately at a glance uh, find the distribution of these different uh, uh, values of the values for the different features uh, we can also use the, the histogram method in the, the um, uh, data frame. So note that this is the plot method using uh, a plot of type histogram. It draws everything on the same plot. The histogram method draws individual histograms. So uh, if we want to separate them and, and take a look, we have this uh, uh, result here. Now, this is uh, one way of easily looking at the different distributions of the individual features. However, one problem with looking at individual features is that we don't have an idea of how they relate to each other. So we don't know if uh, the flowers with longer petals also have wider petals or vice versa or something like that, because we are not seeing those relations. Even so, it may be a good idea to do this and have a, a notion of how the different features are distributed. And one way of uh, uh, looking at this in a very simplified manner, if you don't want to look at the actual distributions in the histograms, is to use a, a box plot. A box plot is a very simplified representation of the distributions, where you have boxes representing the values between the two quartiles, quartile 1 and quartile 3. So they represent the 50% uh, or the half of the, the, the data points in the, the intermediate quartiles in, uh, here. Uh, we have a midline for the, the median and then we have the, uh, these whiskers which uh, show us where the, the distribution range ends that are placed at uh, either the smallest value of uh, uh, the feature or the first quartile uh, minus uh, one constant multiplied by the distance between the quartiles. Typically, this is 1.5. So basically, uh, if uh, uh, we either draw the whisker at the smallest value or if uh, the smallest value is below uh, this expression here, we draw the whisker there and uh, and uh, um, uh, draw the outliers uh, 
has the, these uh, values that are outside. And the same thing for the other part. So this is, is easier to understand if we look at the graph. So this is, uh, for example, for sepal length, we have this box representing the uh, quartile one to quartile three. So this box contains one half of the, the values. They are all uh, bunched together here in this box. Uh, and 25% of them are below this and 25% of the values are above this. These uh, whiskers here represent the smallest value of sepal length and the largest value of sepal length. So here we have a, a, an idea at a glance that the range of values uh, is here from around 4.2 or something like that to 8, but one half of the points are all uh, grouped together here between 5 and 6 something. And here, this is the median, this is the line that divides the, the data into two. Uh, now, in this case, there are no outliers. If uh, there are outliers, and these are determined by the position of the whiskers, uh, which take the difference between the two quartiles here, multiplied by 1.5, this is the default value for this W, the, the most useful value, used uh, value here. Um, and this is where the normal range ends. So everything that is above this is represented individually as outliers and the same thing here on the other side. So this is, um, this is the position of the last point that is within the range for the whiskers, which is in this case quartile one minus 1.5 the range between the, the quartile one and quartile three and this is also the the point the last point that is inside the normal range everything that is that falls outside the whiskers is represented here as outliers so we can see that for example petal length is uh, very widely distributed here uh, sepal width is very concentrated on this region but there are a few outliers and so on uh, and this uh, gives us a better way of looking at the distribution of data if we have lots of features. If we have only four features, then uh, histograms are still uh, feasible because we can look at each of them and have an idea of, of the range and so on. Or we can even super, superimpose them so that they are all on the same scale on the axis. But if you have a larger number of features, this becomes very confusing. And so box plots are uh, very useful for understanding data when we have a, a larger number of features. Now, uh, all of these plots that we saw so far show each feature individually. It, they do not tell us how the features are related. One way of looking at correlations between features is a scatter matrix plot, which shows two-dimensional projections of pairs of features. We are only looking at correlations between pairs of features, but still this is more informative than looking at them individually. You can do this with pandas using the scatter matrix function uh, from the plotting module. And what this does is create uh, an array of plots where you are crossing each uh, feature with all the other features. So for example, here we have sepal length and it's uh, crossed with sepal width, with petal length and petal width. Uh, and this allows us to see, for example, that the length of the sepal is very strongly correlated with the length of the petal. We can see here this diagonal, which means that flowers that have longer sepals have longer petals too. The, the diagonal of this matrix, which is a comparison of each uh, feature with itself, uh, this would not be informative because it would just be a straight line. So instead of doing the, the scatter plot, the, the scatter matrix plot shows the distribution. This can either be with kernel density estimation, if you uh, choose KD in this diagonal argument, or it can be a histogram if you choose the, the hist. So you can select how the distributions are represented in the diagonal. But the most uh, uh, useful feature of this scatter matrix plot is to identify these kinds of correlations between different features. So we, we know which features are more independent of each other. They have these kinds of, of uh, uh, blobs here with no uh, strong correlation and which ones are more strongly correlated. Um, 
so uh, another way of trying to look at the the features so this uh, tells us how they are related in pairs but it doesn't give us information about how the whole set of features are related on the same data points only looking we are only looking at correlations between pairs of features so one attempt to to do that is to use parallel coordinates Imagine that you plot each point as a, a, a set of line segments where you place parallel uh, Y coordinate axis along the plot and then join with the line the values of all the features there. Uh, so this you can do with the parallel coordinates method and it gives you something like this. Uh, this is the, the axis for the sepal length for the sepal width, the petal length and the petal width. And one, one flower, one example in our data, has four values for these features. So we can draw it as, the, as a line, joining its value of the sepal length with the value of the sepal width, and then the petal length and the petal width. And we can even separate them by classes. So Pandas does this automatically. And you can see that this is uh, the the set of lines for Virginica. Here we have Versicolor and here we have Setosa. Uh, and this gives us uh, an immediate visualization of how the different uh, attributes relate to each other on the same examples. Uh, so we can see, for example, that uh, Versicolor has a, a, a lower um, value for petal lengths usually than, than the others. Uh, but, uh, uh, no, uh, Setosa, sorry has a lower value for petal length, uh, but also that this seems to be uh, positively correlated with sepal width and with petal width, because we don't see much crossing here. The, the, the lines seem to be more or less parallel. Uh, if there was a lot of crossing, then this would be inversely correlated on these points. Uh, and so this is one, parallel coordinates is a very useful way of visualizing uh, our data when we have several features this doesn't work well if we have many features because then uh, not only the plot becomes very confusing but it also depends on how we order the features so we get different representations if we exchange the order of the features but even so it's a it's an informative plot to understand how the features are related uh, a variant uh, of this we can uh, do this if we don't have uh, different classes so Pandas assumes that there will be a, a, a class uh, a class label here uh, where it uh, distinguishes between them. But if we want, we can create um, a, a new data matrix, a new data frame with only these first columns, and then add a, a name a dummy a class, which is equal for all of them. So in this case, this would be uh, doing this plot if we did not have the class labels. So even without the class labels, we would find that there is something here that is different from the rest uh, because we can see it uh, quite differently in the, the way the, the features are related. Another way of looking at uh, this kind of plot, of, of plotting the, uh, the different examples and looking at all the features when there are more than two, is to use curves uh, in which we are going to add uh, these uh, functions, sine and cosine functions, to get different oscillations. We add them with different frequencies and we multiply the amplitude of each component will be each, uh, um, each feature. So basically, the, the horizontal, the vertical position of the line is determined by the first feature. Then the longest uh, wave uh, period component is the, the second feature and third for the sine and cosine. And then we increase the frequencies for higher frequency components. You can do this with the under curves uh, function in Pandas, and it uh, gives you something like this. Uh, the amplitude at different frequencies is determined by the different uh, features, and so we can separate the, uh, the different classes easily here because of the different relations of the feature values. This is something analogous to parallel coordinates. Uh, however, it, um, it has 
one advantage in that um, it's not as confusing as uh, parallel coordinates with the problem of changing the order of the uh, the features in this case we use some for higher frequencies and some for lower frequencies but the curves do not uh, do not change uh, that much but it it lacks some some more intuitive properties that parallel coordinates have because uh, those we can immediately see the values of different features and here they are a bit hidden in the different components at different frequencies so it's a bit harder to interpret uh, these plots but the idea is the same instead of representing each example as a point we represent each example as a line and the shape of the line tells us information about the values of the features for that example and this could be extended to uh, any number of dimensions in our data uh, radvis is a is a, a a way also of visualizing the relations between the the features and the idea here is that each data point is uh, uh, plotted in this radial uh, plot here where we have the different features spread out uniformly at the perimeter of the an imaginary circle here and the value of each feature is pulling the point towards the feature so uh, points that are here have a larger sepal width than all the other features points that are here in the middle are more balanced in the distribution of values through the different features if we had some flowers in which the petal width for example would be larger than everything else they would be uh, uh, here close to this uh, uh, point here so this gives us an idea of how of which features dominate in each example in this case each example is a point but it's being represented on, on a position that takes into account the pool uh, of all these different features as a function of their uh, relative values uh, so basically uh, for visualizing data in more than two dimensions we need some way to represent uh, all of these features we can uh, use some simple representations for understanding the individual distributions like histograms kde box plots and so on but those do not give us information on how the features are related in two dimensions we can easily do pairwise plots and look at those uh, um, correlations but this uh, is not very informative if we have m more than two features because we don't see the relations between them but if we do some kinds of, of transformation and these representations like uh, radial plots like with rad v's or parallel coordinates, then we can have an idea of how the, the different features are related in our examples. Another problem that we have when we uh, have many features is uh, how to select them. So not all features are equally useful. Sometimes we have features that are very uh, uninformative for what we want and also if we are doing for example supervised learning we can have problems with overfitting if we have uh, too many features so we may need to simplify the model and that may require discarding some features uh, also in practical problems features are also are often costly to to measure uh, for example you can imagine in in medical diagnostics there are some things that are easy and uh, inexpensive to measure like temperature or blood pressure or something like that but if you need specific analysis for enzymatic activities or antibodies then you need more expensive tests so in in many practical situations we need to decide if it's worth the cost of obtaining some feature for our data so basically feature selection methods are uh, meant to reduce the number of features that we have by picking those that are best for our uh, problem this is uh, something that is often related to supervised learning because uh, very often we need to do uh, feature selection to improve classifiers but it can be used also to improve unsupervised learning uh, uh, so problems like clustering for example um, and uh, uh, so I decided to put this part here because we are transitioning away from uh, supervised learning but basically the problem is deciding which features are the best how can we uh, decide that and one easy uh, context in which this becomes obvious is when we are trying to predict something for example with uh, classification 
Uh, in that case, one uh, way of doing this with univariate filters is to uh, check for the, the difference between the observed uh, probability uh, that we have of, uh, say, having some class when the feature takes some value uh, and what would be expected at random in that particular case. And the difference between these two if they if the variables have the same distribution so if the feature is not telling us anything new about uh, that class this would be distributed with a, a key square probability distribution so if the probability of this uh, becomes very low under the key square distribution then we can reject the hypothesis that uh, the the frequency observed and expected are the same and if we can reject that, this means that the feature is very informative about the, uh, that particular classification. So let's, let's imagine, this would be just in abstract for the, the general case, but let's imagine that we have one feature that can take k categorical values. It's a categorical feature, for example, it can take values 0, 1 and 2 or something like that and has uh, only these values. And we have data divided in C classes. For example, we have two classes. Uh, what we can do is uh, the expected uh, number of times we have, uh, for example, class 1 with some particular value k for the feature should be the fraction of uh, times vi uh, the, uh, the class uh, appears. So uh, if the class 1 uh, appears 30% of the time, we expect that when the feature has uh, value 2, for example, 30% of the time it will correspond to class 1. So this is assuming that there is the feature is independent of the class and is not giving us any information. And this would be the actual frequency with which class 1 appears when the feature has this value k. So we can measure this for all the, the classes C and for all the values K, and we can test the, uh, the key square, this against the key square distribution with these degrees of freedom. So it depends on the number of values we have uh, on the feature and the number of classes. But what this test tells us is that if the, the probability of, of this value occurring in this key square distribution is sufficiently high, we cannot say that the feature is being useful and telling us something different from what would be expected uh, at random. But if the probability is very low, then this means that there is a large difference between the distribution of the classes in different uh, values of the feature and what would be expected at random. And in that case, this tells us that the feature is very informative about the class. So another kind of univariate filter that uh, is well known uh, is analysis of variance. So basically this uses this uh, uh, F-test with this distribution by comparing the variance between the classes. So we are covering all the different classes in our data and we are uh, considering the difference between the, the average for that class and the average for the, the whole uh, data set. And we are comp uh, comparing that relative to the variance within classes. So this is uh, doing the same thing, but uh, considering the points in the class and uh, the average of the class. Uh, intuitively, what this tells us is that if the, the variance between the classes is high relative to the variance within the, the classes, th then this particular feature is uh, varying more between the different classes then uh, it normally varies. And this means that it is uh, giving us information about the classes. However, if the reverse happens, if uh, the variance within the classes is high with, uh, compared to the variance between the classes, then this means that the feature is just changing a lot from example to example or not changing more between different classes than it uh, changes between examples. And in that case, it would not be an informative feature. So this is another statistical test that we can do to decide if the features uh, are uh, informative about the classes or not. One big difference between the two is that this key square test 
must be done with frequencies or probabilities, whereas uh, the analysis of variance uh, test can be done with continuous uh, numerical values on the, the, uh, the features. So we can easily apply this uh, more easily in, in uh, a broader range of cases. You can do this in scikit-learn. You have the, the F classification uh, test. F, F classif is a DF test for classification problems where you uh, can input the features matrix and the class labels and it will do this analysis of variance test and return uh, uh, two uh, results which is the DF test values for the different features and the corresponding probabilities in the DF distribution. So in this case we can see that all the features are quite correlated with uh, the classes because we have very low probabilities of this uh, uh, difference between the variances in the, within uh, the, the um, different classes and between the classes uh, is very low under the, the F distribution. So it means that this is probably not happening uh, by chance. But still we can see that uh, in some features give us a very higher uh, F value for the, the tests. So this means that for these features, the variance between classes is much higher than the variance within uh, the classes. And it also correspondingly gives us a, a much lower probability of this happening by chance. So basically we can uh, use this to select the best features, those more correlated with the classes, which are the third and the fourth uh, features that we have. So now we can project everything into these features and uh, this is our iris data in only two dimensions choosing the two best features the one that are uh, the ones that are more strongly correlated with the data now here in this graph we can see a limitation of univariate filtering which is we are looking at each of these features individually and real uh, it's really the case that either of them uh, is strongly correlated with the class but they are also strongly correlated to one another so basically choosing both of them is not giving us much more information than choosing just one of them because the other is telling the same thing uh, practically uh, so this may be in this case it could be a better idea to choose one of them but then choose one of the others if it was less correlated with the first one and we're going to see uh, that too but you can do uh, univariate filtering with the analysis of variance easily in scikit-learn by using this uh, select k-best uh, um, uh, object here, which basically receives the, the function that does the test, the statistical test, and the number of components that you want. And then if you uh, do this fit transform it does the fit first computing the the analysis of variance for all the different columns on the the feature matrix and then transform this by selecting only the two best so this x new matrix will only have the two best features of the original matrix according to that analysis of variance that you get for classification problems with the f classif function uh, so here uh, other possibilities would be to use uh, correlations, mutual information and so on. So basically anything that tells us if the feature is being useful for predicting the class could be used here for univariate filtering. And the idea is always to try to compare each attribute to some variable that you want to predict. Uh, and so this requires uh, the, the, these target values y. But uh, in some cases, you can use this also for unsupervised learning if you have the, the label and then use the features for clustering or things like that. So it's not, it's not mandatory that after you do this, you proceed for, to supervised learning. You can be doing this in, in other contexts. Um, there is another way of, of doing feature selection, which is to actually train the model with one feature and check the performance and then doing it again with another feature and so on. And these are uh, wrapper methods basically where we uh, are using uh, the model that we want to use at the end to test 
how different features perform. And usually these methods are done with combinations of features and not one at a time. So basically univariate filtering is more often used with simple statistical techniques just to rule out some, uh, some features that are not interesting. And then we can use more sophisticated uh, selection methods for multivariate filtering. So in this case, we are uh, considering combinations of features and uh, using the information of those combinations to select them. One way we can do is uh, to check for correlation between feature pairs. Uh, ideally, we should we want features that correlate with the class. So, for example, these features correlate pretty well with the class, but we do not want features that correlate strongly to one another because having these two features does not give us much information than just having one of them. Uh, so uh, we don't want redundant features, which are those that correlate with uh, another feature. And although the relevance of the features, which is the correlation with what we want to predict, is something that we use only on uh, supervised learning uh, contexts, this redundancy is something that can be applied in unsupervised learning too, because we can check for correlation between features even if we don't want, uh, we don't have any labels or we are not trying to predict anything uh, with uh, supervised learning. So this is one uh, feature selection uh, criteria that we can apply regardless of whether we are in supervised or unsupervised learning. Basically, discarding any feature that correlates strongly with another feature that we already have, because this additional feature will be redundant, will not give us additional information that is useful. We can extend this to any number of features in combination, and we can do this easily by uh, wrapper methods, which basically uh, consist in trying different combinations of features with, uh, for training some model, for example, the model that we want to use in uh, classification or the model that we want to use for clustering, something like that. And we evaluate the result. And now we're going to search through different combinations of features and find out which combination gives us the, the better result. In general, in wrapper methods, we are using the same machine learning algorithm that, we're going to, that we want to use at the end, so that we are actually measuring the performance on the algorithm that we want to use. This is uh, uh, easy to implement and to, and to uh, think about. The only problem here is the combinatorial problem of finding all the combinations of uh, features. So you can select a subset of features, pass through the algorithm that you want to use and measure the performance. But now you have to do this again and again and again for different combinations. So you can do this deterministically, either with sequential forward selection or sequential backward elimination. And this is basically doing one feature at a time because Testing all the combinations is uh, uh, exponential and uh, with the, on the number of features, so it quickly explodes and we cannot do that in practice. But we can do this by adding one feature at a time. So basically, check one uh, feature isolatedly and pick the one that gives you the best performance. And now, retaining that one, to t test each of the other ones individually and retain the, the one that combined with the first one gives you the best performance. And now go on for the third, the fourth, and you stop when either you reach a desired number of features or you, uh, the improvement uh, becomes very low or you no longer can improve the results. Eventually, they may even degrade and the performance of your, your uh, models may, may decrease. You can do this backwards in sequential backward elimination where you start with all the features and you test each individual feature in that context of the, the whole set to see which is the best one to remove without degrading performance. So it can actually lead sometimes to improvement or it's the one that leads to the smallest degradation on, on performance if you are just trying to cut features uh, without actually uh, trying to get better results but just to, to simplify the data. But in any case, you're going to pick the one that is best to throw away and you keep doing this until you reach the desired number of features. 
Um, if you want to use the majority of features, then probably sequential backward elimination is more efficient because you only have to eliminate a few of them. If you want to, to discard the majority of features, then it may be better to start from one, two, three, and then stop early uh, with only a few. So this would be for this uh, deterministic approach. You can use non-deterministic wrappers by testing different combinations of features without going in some pre-specified uh, pre order. For example, using uh, uh, Monte Carlo methods, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, things like that, that try to sample the, the space of combinations in a non-deterministic manner. There are also uh, uh, models that can embed feature selection. For example, if you do L1 regularization on uh, um, classification with linear classifiers or with uh, uh, um, linear regression, since L1 regularization tends to, uh, pin, uh, since L1 regularization penalizes the absolute value of the parameters, this tends to force uh, parameters that are not um, useful to zero. So it means it switches off in a linear model, it switches off those features that are being multiplied by the parameters that are zero. So in effect, it's discarding some features and selecting the others. Uh, so logistic regression, for example, you can do with L1 regularization, and this will automatically discard or all useless uh, features. Uh, you can use uh, some uh, methods that also do this automatically. For example, decision trees. If you have a feature that is not relevant, it will never appear on the rules that the decision tree algorithm finds. Uh, you can use uh, feature-weighted naive base uh, classifiers that uh, make uh, give different weights to different features and can give a weight of zero on a feature that is not uh, informative. So there are some particular uh, methods that actually include embed feature selection, either because of regularization or because of the way uh, the algorithms are, uh, are uh, uh, work. Uh, so basically, to uh, summarize this, we can uh, apply filters before using our models uh, with simple statistical methods uh, to uh, discard or select some features. These can be uh, univariate filters looking at each feature individually. They can look at correlation between features or uh, something like that. We can use wrapper methods where we search through combinations of features by using those combinations to train our models. Or we can use embedded feature selection if the model can automatically uh, look at uh, during training, uh, evaluates the usefulness of features and discard it. Okay, so to sum up this part, we saw uh, this basic idea behind unsupervised learning. We are going beyond this uh, approach of just trying to predict something and focusing on that measure of the error. We are now trying to uh, more broadly use, uh, find some useful information in the data and convert the data or uh, analyze the data or understand the data in a better way. And we saw two things that are related to unsupervised learning, although in this lecture we still did not start properly looking at unsupervised learning methods, but this is data visualization, which is very important for understanding data when you're dealing with real problems, and feature selection. So feature selection, uh, you can have wrapper methods in the unsupervised learning, for example, test clustering with different combinations of features, but very often those statistical uh, uh, methods, for example, univariate features, uh, filters looking at the correlation of the feature with the labels that we want to predict, those uh, are often uh, restricted to supervised learning. However, feature selection is also related to feature extraction, which we're going to look at in the next lecture, and that uh, tends to use a lot of unsupervised learning methods. So if you want to read more about this, you can check the, the visualization tutorial in Pandas. This uh, has lots more examples than I, I showed here. You also have a feature selection 
tutorial on the scikit-learn documentation and there are some uh, some references here in alpidon for for this part the this uh, structure of different types of filtering and uh, feature selection i uh, mentioned here is based on this review paper in, in the bioinformatics magazine uh, so if you want to take a look in more detail you can check uh, this paper too